I'm going to be discussing um, the disorders of the peripheral nervous system. So before we jump into the actual disorders, I want to give a brief background on A and P of the neuromuscular junction. In essence, the neuron, its components, and the neuromuscular junction where the uh, neurotransmitters travel to create some type of connection with the receptors. So there's an impulse and you have the action potential that begins up there, goes all the way down here, right? So to start off, let's describe the actual structures here. This is the neuron. And the neuron is the, um, is the main cell in the nervous system that allows for communication throughout its, you know, it's, it's the brain and also throughout the entire body. Um, to start off, these little tentacles down here are known as dendrites. And the whole purpose of dendrites is for them to receive electrical impulses from other parts of the body, from other, ner uh, from other neurons, so they can conduct the impulses and communicate with one another. And so they essentially work their way inward towards the soma or the cell body. So you have the little appendages known as the dendrites, they receive electrical impulses. You have right here what we call the soma or the cell body. And inside you have the nucleus. The electrical impulse um, makes its way through the soma down towards this long appendage that we know as the axon, okay? Now, the axon is really important simply because it's surrounded by myelin sheath. Myelin sheath is a, a um, fatty substance that surrounds the actual axon and it works very similar to like the chargers of the cell phones that we have right so if we look at any particular charger outside you have um, a substance that's usually plastic or rubber or in this place it's a bit synthetic and it protects the inner wires that conduct the electrical impulses from the source of energy to our cell phone right but what happens when our, um, especially like the iPhone ones, right? They always get singed and fringed and not singed, but fringed and um, they kind of get broken up a little bit. The connection is not adequate. So I want you guys to associate uh, a similar parallel between the, the, our cell phone chargers and this whole axon. It has a protective layer that's known as a myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is a protective covering that prevents short circuiting, that allows for conduction of electrical impulses to increase, and it potentiates its action potential. And that's the influx and the outflux of different ions in order for it to create an electrical charge. So the electrical impulse travels down the axon and it performs something called saltatory conduction. And saltatory conduction, the idea of that, Saltatory conduction reminds me of like when I was a kid and we used to have those uh, race tracks. And, you know, we used to have our little cars that would um, that would essentially travel through the track. But on either side of the track, we used to have this like these little balls or these little wheels like this or these rubber um, these rubber tires or something that would kind of be spinning consecutively this way. And the same thing with um, this way, with spin. And so as we would put the car in here and it would go this way, those little devices that were spinning consistently would speed up its, uh, the, the velocity of the car and then it would speed up again and it would maintain momentum and the speed of the, of the little car, little Hot Wheels or Matchboxes, whatever the hell we used, right? Well, that's kind of how this works. Every time it passes, the electrical impulses passes from one end to the next, it speeds up its, its conduction, its saltatory conduction, it hops, saltar, which is in Spanish to hop. It hops from one to, end to the next, and that speeds up the electrical impulse. The myelin sheet insulates it, it protects it, it prevents short circuiting, and essentially that's how it works. The little gaps in between are known as the nodes of Ranvier. okay? And so this is the basic anatomy of the neuron so far. We have this other appendage that's a little bit different because it's increasing in volume. And inside you actually have what we call vesicles that have the substances that will eventually become our neurotransmitters. But again, this right here is known as the axon terminal. It's kind of like a terminal at the airport when things are about to take off. Same thing with this one. The electrical impulse, again, is received by the dendrites, passes through the axon, which is protected by the myelin sheath, which does all those elements, which creates all those, um, those properties that we discussed when I was saying that it speeds up the impulse, it prevents short-circuiting, and all those other things, right? 
And then the electrical impulse gets to the axon terminal. Inside, you have these vesicles and these little pockets of substances that once the, electric, the, electri the electrical impulse gets there, they become or they release your specific neurotransmitter. And the neurotransmitter that I want to talk about right now is known as acetylcholine. This is going to be a neurotransmitter that's going to be of, uh, of great importance simply because it's what's required for the muscle contraction to occur. So you have to have all of these elements that are intact. The action potential must be there. You have to have adequate um, integrity of the myelin sheath. And you have to have available acetylcholine to be released from the axon terminals. And again, these are the neurotransmitters. And then they get into the muscle and its receptors. So all these little appendages that you guys see within the little crevices of the muscle, it's supposed to detect, excuse me, it's supposed to detect, uh, to depict um, the receptor sites. And the receptor sites are like the catcher, the actual neurons like the pitcher, and the little, uh, little acetylcholine neurotransmitter is like the ball. Uh, we need all three of those elements to be intact in order for the signaling to be conducted adequately so it can relay the information and release the acetylcholine so it can get to the receptor sites and eventually allow for a whole bunch of chemical reactions to occur which deal with electrolytes, with ions, um, and substances or potentials that will increase or generate an electrical impulse that will allow the muscle to do what it has to do and contract. And in essence, that's how muscle contraction occurs. However, our body is very unique in that it doesn't like to waste, okay? So every time we have any action potential, our body releases a certain amount of acetylcholine that's required for us to create movement. But if we're only gonna be doing something like this, a very small movement, does our muscle require all of that acetylcholine? The answer is no. So we actually have a recycler, or at least I call it the recycler, and let's just kind of show it in this little circle right here. Um, let's say that's it right there. This is an element that's known as cholinesterase. Now, cholinesterase is the recycler that I'm discussing right now. Cholinesterase makes its way in here to the synapse, okay, the space in between the axon terminal and the muscle fiber, which collectively we call the neuromuscular junction, by the way. Let me write that down real quick neuromuscular junction, okay? And so that acetylcholine travels from the axon terminal through the synaptic cleft, the synapse, the space, into the muscle fibers, which attach themselves onto the receptor sites. But any additional acetylcholine that our body does not need, our cholinesterase will come in here and it will recycle it. At least I want you guys to think of it in that fashion. It's gonna recycle it and then reabsorb it back into the system or break it down so we're, we, we're not wasteful individuals. And if all those elements are intact, then your body's gonna have adequate muscle contraction. I want you guys to understand the main components that we discussed. You need, you need the myelin sheath to be intact. You need the electrical conduction to be intact, which is all of this stuff is your pitcher. You need the acetylcholine to be activated so it can be released throughout the synaptic cleft and the acetylcholine becomes the ball. And then you need the catches to be intact, the receptor sites to be active, to be receptive to those acetylcholine neurotransmitters in order for them to relay that information down to the muscle so it can carry out its function of muscle contraction. If you guys understand those basic concepts, then it's going to be a lot easier to understand the, uh, the degenerative issues that we'll be discussing, which include multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, and guillain barr syndrome. Okay, so let me get to that real quick where I can find my eraser. Okay, so let's talk about the three most common disorders that you guys are gonna be including in your studying when you're trying to take the end clutch, right? And again, this is to provide a background, a fundamental understanding of what's supposed to happen so you understand how each of these disorders are being affected when some of those components go, go, go wrong, right? So let's talk about multiple sclerosis first. Multiple sclerosis. Okay, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune issue, 
that it affects women a lot more than men. And what ends up happening is you have demyelination. The myelin sheath that I was discussing earlier that creates all those abilities of the axon to deliver the action potential and the electrical impulse so it can get to the vesicles to produce the acetylcholine and all that stuff that I was talking about. That myelin sheath becomes broken down by autoimmune properties. And so it's like having that iPhone charger or that Android charger, whatever, the cell phone charger that breaks down and you have to wiggle it a little bit more in order for us to really generate that conduction so our cell phones charge. That's the implication with multiple sclerosis. So you have demyelination, you have breaking down of these, of these components that maintain the integrity of the nervous system of your, of your myelin sheath. And the impulse that's supposed to travel this way is impaired. And the vesicles do not receive the adequate action potential, the electrical impulse that's required to generate that acetylcholine. So one of the biggest things that you're gonna start noticing with multiple sclerosis is you're gonna have uh, an issue with, um, with movement. It, it affects our motor neurons. And so one of the first things that the patient is going to start manifesting is issues like paresthesia, um, abnormal sensation, because the communication between those segments of the body and the muscles become impaired. As time goes by or as the patient gets older, which means as we get older, our immune system is not as strong as it was at one point. Well, our autoimmune properties are destroying the system. They wreak havoc in the system until eventually you'll develop spasticity, you'll develop paralysis, you'll develop flaccidity, and even spastic issues with your bladder, with your intestines. So as a nurse, you have to think about what is your role when it comes to this disorder? Excuse me. We can't cure the, these issues, right, with uh, conventional medicine or Western medicine at the very least, right? But we do have to provide specific interventions. So once the patient starts having this arthria, which is garbled speech, well, now you have to think about the airway. The patient's not going to be able to speak that well, put words together. So now their speech pattern starts changing, their swallowing ability may be impaired. So you're going to start instilling um, interventions that protect the airway. You're going to have to think about particular assessments with a the speech therapist so they can prescribe the adequate type of food so the texture is adequate so they don't aspirate. That's how I want you guys to think when it comes to the context of multiple sclerosis and it affecting the airway. Um, anytime the condition affects your bladder, Okay, you may start developing spasticity, which can lead to urine retention. It can lead to incontinence, and that's going to be something of concern. So you have to start thinking about bladder issues, maybe intermittent catheterization. Of course, that's a more invasive intervention. However, it's still something that's very possible that's going to be required for your patient with multiple sclerosis. Same thing with bowel elimination. Bowel elimination becomes a problem for these patients as the nerves can no longer conduct their impulses through the intestinal tract, and that leads to a lack in peristalsis or abnormal peristalsis, which can lead to ileus, which is a, a, an obstruction. So you want to think about adequate bowel habits, and you always want to start your interventions with the least invasive, least restrictive, in order to be able to scaffold, to build on top of that. So initial interventions are usually non-medicated, independent interventions that are easy to carry out. Once we've attempted those issues and they're not helping the patient address their, their, their respective issues, then we start moving with more intrusive, invasive means of, of intervention, such as medications or intermittent catheterization or for bowel elimination, cathartics, any medication that's gonna help the patient defecate, okay? So in a nutshell, folks, that's multiple sclerosis, demyelination of the myelin sheath, which interferes with adequate conduction from the neurons to the muscles. Our next one is um, Guillain-Barr syndrome, GBS. Now, this one's also an autoimmune issue. However, this one is unique because it presents as an ascending paralysis, meaning that it's usually, first of all, secondary to an immunological activation, whether it's a vaccine, whether the patient had um, an infection, that anything that stimulates the immune system. And if you do so with the way with uh, not the right, not the right elements, but if the, if the storm is perfect, per se, then 
this patient will develop uh, acute demyelination of all of your neurons that contain myelin sheath, but it's an ascending paralysis, and that's unique to the condition because multiple sclerosis is not specific like that. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is, though. It starts from the lower extremities, and, it's, and it works its way up, and it can go all the way up to your head, right, with the paralysis, but it can stop in various locations, so you have to become very familiar with that. If you have widespread demyelination, you understand that that whole communication, it's not working that well. So you have to instill interventions to protect the patient's, um, it's going to be ABCs, guys. Um, the biggest issue with Guillain-Barre syndrome is that as the paralysis ascends, right, if it affects your thoracic area, now you got to think about your breathing patterns. The patient's inner, inner costal muscles may be affected, the diaphragm. And once those muscles become affected, the patient will not be able to breathe. And now we got to start thinking about potential for intubation so the patient can breathe with artificial airway. So those are the elements that you guys have to know because we don't know what the NCLEX is going to ask you. But if you understand those basic components, you can build on top of that and address the issues accordingly. So with Guillain-Barre syndrome, the beautiful component of this particular disorder is that unlike in multiple sclerosis, which is uh, progressive and it just gets worse and worse and worse, um, GBS has its limitations. It's going to exacerbate. It's going to cause its damage. But generally speaking, it's treatable. We can intubate the patient if the respiratory system becomes compromised and we can wait for the exacerbation to, um, to, be, co to, be, to be concluded. And then we perform extensive rehab for the patient so they can regain their, um, their physical mobility patterns again. And so that's the main issue with Guillain-Barre syndrome. As a nurse, you have to be considering their airway, their breathing patterns. This happens in an onset of several hours up to a couple days. So we have to make sure that we're on top of that with these patients. Um, as a patient becomes better, their mobility has to be regained through therapy. So it's our job to enact adequate um, supervision so the patient won't hurt themselves and falls. Re reduction of risk potential is very important. Reduction of risk um, uh, for safety issues is really important. So we have to ensure that we instate parameters that will provide that particular safety. Okay. And then lastly, we have myasthenia gravis. Now, myasthenia gravis is very important because this particular condition is also autoimmune. But instead of the myelin sheath becoming affected, um, we have the issue with the receptor sites, with the catchers that I was discussing earlier. This is an autoimmune issue in where the receptor sites become destroyed. So the available acetylcholine that we were talking about that must get to the receptor sites. Well, now there's a limited amount of receptor sites for the acetylcholine to latch onto. So it cannot relay its impulse to have the muscle contract adequately. And that's going to be your, uh, your, your main manifestation that you'll be witnessing with these patients. The main difference between myasthenia gravis and the, rest of, and, and the rest of the disorders is that this condition gets worse as the patient becomes more mobile. Again, this patient will experience more deficits, whether it's weakness, paralysis, as the patient becomes more physically active. Because as we become more physically active, the demand for acetylcholine increases and now we don't have adequate amount of receptor sites to promote that movement of acetylcholine into the muscles okay so with myasthenia gravis with gbs or with multiple sclerosis the concepts the ideas are all very similar in the sense that abc's is always priority and the sense that safety is always priority to that and these are all autoimmune issues so the medications which i'll be discussing in my next video are based upon modulating your, uh, your, your immune system so it won't destroy those areas furthermore. However, in myasthenia gravis, there's something unique about this. Because the neurotransmitters, the acetylcholine, is being released, that's not the issue. The issue is that the receptor sites are not available in uh, the numbers that we need them to be in order to facilitate adequate movement. Well, I talked about the recycler earlier, your cholinesterase. If you think about it, cholinesterase is supposed to recycle the unneeded, the unused, um, the cholinesterase is supposed to reabsorb and try to prevent the waste of the unused acetylcholine. But if you have a patient who has MG and we have limited amount of receptor sites, do you think it's a smart move 
for cholinesterase to remove those acetylcholine neurotransmitters? No. We want them to stay there as long as we can, as they can, so they can eventually make their way to the receptor sites that are still functional. And because of that, we want to give anti-cholinesterase medications that suppress the release of cholinesterase so we do not recycle those neurotransmitters of acetylcholine so they can make their way into the actual receptor sites and conduct better movement, okay? And this is essentially what's going on, guys, with these basic um, degenerative neurological disorders. Keep in mind that safety is always going to be your priority for these patients, aspiration precautions, education on um, ways to feed the patients, sit up right, things like that. Ensure that you facilitate adequate swallowing protocols and any indication of aspiration. That's going to be the main focus for these patients. Okay. Keep in mind that mobility is also going to be compromised. Um, your bladder and your GI um, issues may also be developed because of the communication between the nervous system and those particular muscles. So I hope that kind of helped out, folks. I'll give you guys a pharmacology um, video next. Thank you.